our history and our culture have come about because a lot of ordinary people have done some really terrible jobs. And our traditional Christmas is no exception. However dreadful it's been having to do all that shopping, however ghastly being stuck with your in-laws and your relatives' children, you can put your feet up and gloat, because there's loads of people who've had far worse Christmases than you'll ever have. Stand by to find out. About the gross inside job behind the Christmas roast? Disgusting, but strangely interesting how slimy seaweed made Jane Austen's table festive, and why Panto relied on dangerous chemistry. Welcome to the worst Christmas jobs in history. Could be the worst Christmas job. Shepherds abiding in their fields, watching their flocks by night, when lo, an angel appears, and they all go off and see the baby Jesus. It's the most famous part of the Christmas nativity story. But funnily enough, it proves that Christmas didn't happen in December, because December is the rainy month in Judea and all the flocks are taken in for the night. So if the shepherds were good Jewish boys, they would have all been tucked up asleep in bed, listening to the Romans celebrating their midwinter feast. The Roman feast of Saturnalia lasted from the middle to the end of December. They gave each other presents, they stuffed down food, they drank till they were sick and they nursed monumental hangovers. Saturnalia was so popular that when Christians tried to get people celebrating Jesus' birth in March or April, it never caught on. That's why they tacked their religious feast onto this older pagan boozer. So next time you're at the office Christmas party and someone starts bleating on about this not being the real spirit of Christmas, tell them they're wrong. Shoveling down food and guzzling booze is the original spirit of Christmas. This one for me? Yes. Cheers. Was it the Romans who actually invented binge drinking, though? They drink an awful lot at the Saturnalia. At the time, they're very luxurious. They eat a lot and then they drink a lot. But also in the first century AD, they developed drinking on an empty stomach for the first time. Could they hold their liquor? No, I and mean, we have plenty of, plenty of information about people being sick, people throwing wine cups at parties. And also, in wall painting, we find images of people throwing up, right, aided by slaves often. And it's throwing up that's central to our first worst job, which used to take place in the Roman dining room. And by an eerie coincidence, we actually happen to have a Roman dining room right next door. Welcome to the world of the puke collector. Come here. Good Lord, a room full of Roman revelers, looking remarkably like the people in the pub next door. <laughs> Roman wine was deadly stuff. When the party really got going, the slaves, who I'm calling puke collectors, had to run around clearing up. Other than that, it was pretty much like our Christmas lunch, right down to the party hats. Fiona, what is that hat? It's a Phrygian cap. A Phrygian cap. Do women wear them too? Oh, yes. And what do they signify? They signify liberty. They're the cap given to slaves when they're freed. But at the Saturnalia, everybody wears them because it's the idea that this is the time where the poor and the rich and even the slaves will sit down with their masters. And everybody is equal for, let's say, about a week of the year. So Eric doesn't have to be serving all night? Well, this household obviously aren't playing the egalitarian game because not every Roman household does that So at the Saturnalia. So he's having to stand up, he's still having to work. Eric, this is an egalitarian household. You can sit down, mate. I'll do your job. Thank you very much. John, have you got one of those caps? You uh, hold my There's a common belief that Romans had a room called a vomitarium where they used to throw up. Sadly for me, it's not quite true. You're the slave, so you've got to clear up. Uh, do we actually know that slaves had to clear up the sick at parties? We, we know this quite clearly from literary writers. Seneca's letters are particularly rich on sort of condemning the excess of drinking and eating, and also the excess of having your slaves do everything for you, even clearing up puke 
there are some things you can't do. You can't laugh at their jokes. You can't hiccup. You can't sneeze. You can't cough, or they're going to beat you. And in, even in some households, such as the Friedman Tremelchio's house, he goes for a pee, he washes his hands, and he might dry his hands on your hair. Claire, you're not going to throw up as well, eh? No, I hope not, because uh, women who threw up were considered loose women, possibly adulterous. You mm, hold on to it then, mate. How many days a year do they have to do this? It's a 365 day of the year job because you're the slave, they don't have dinner without you, so you have to do it. At the Saturnalia or our Christmas you might get extra food, even the meanest master would give you extra wine, so you do get something. This is quite foul, right? Just about mopped that up, right? Yeah. But you get free food, which can't be too bad, and these olives are actually rather nice. But However bad this job might have been, at least it was indoors. During the festive season, some jobs were much worse. Actually, Claire, you do look a bit green. Twenty-seven. Twenty-eight. Now, this is a strange job. Someone has had to do this every Christmas Eve here in Dewsbury since the Middle Ages. And it gets harder every year because this isn't ordinary bell ringing. In order to celebrate the defeat of the devil when Christ was born, they do what they call the devil's knell, which is ringing the bell once for every year of the Christian era. So that's over 2,000 yanks of the rope by now. And it's not just any bell. Black Tom weighs as much as a Mini Cooper. That's 43. 44. 43, that's the uh, year in which the Romans invaded Britain, so there's still quite a few to go. Let's whiz on a few hundred years. Hear the page and stand by me If thou knowest it telling by the 9th century, the Christian version of Christmas is spreading across Northern Europe. In the Czech Republic, a Christian saint, King Wenceslas, goes down in history for his reputation for charity. When good King Wenceslas looked out in the carol, the poor man who came in sight gathering winter fuel had a worst job. He was a faggoter. For hundreds of years, faggoters collected firewood to burn or sell for a few coppers. Faggots were a poor man's log. Archaeologists have excavated medieval faggots, so we know how they were made. Bundling the twigs made them slower to burn. But tying them with freezing fingers is a painful business. Very good. My very first faggot. Can you help me get it on my back? Yeah. I know this... Uh, must look like there isn't much to it, but actually, once the enclosures happened and the land that everybody could go on was suddenly under private control, this became a very difficult job because either you had to take the risk of going onto somebody's land and getting caught, or else you bought it off the landlord. Where's my arm going? In which case, you paid over the odds for it. Okay. Or else you got it on the black market. And there are stories of people actually being sent to Australia, to the penal colonies, just for collecting faggots. So, uh, you know, maybe in the early Middle Ages it wasn't so bad, but after a while it became something that was very, very scary to do. See you later, Harold. Yep. In his master's kitchen, where the snow lay in head. Heat was in the very short that the face had written. Forty twenty. Forty twenty-one. We're now in the Middle Ages, and that's when we get the first recorded Christmas carol. Not good King Wenceslas, it was one about a boar's head, because in the Middle Ages they used to eat boar's head at Christmas. But of course, in order to eat a boar's head, first of all, you've got to catch your boar. And that meant more worse jobs. A wild boar weighs up to 40 stone. 
It can run at 30 miles an hour and leap a four-foot gate. When threatened, it's fearless. Its razor-sharp tusks can kill and maim. And it's recently returned to the woods of Sussex. In medieval times, you had to catch this king of the forest for the Christmas feast, but it was cold, dangerous work. Unarmed peasants were sent out in all weathers to track them, then lure and drive them from dense thicket towards their heavily armed masters. Luckily for me, boar are also extremely shy, so I had the other authentic medieval experience, trudging around for hours expecting the worst, but seeing yeah, nothing but snowy see. prints. But even once the boar was caught and killed, the worst jobs were just beginning. The ceremonial head had to be prepared by the cook's assistant in the grim world of the medieval kitchen. Right, so this is our Christmas celebration. How do I get all this stuff off? We're going to have to burn it off. You can't cut it off. What, over the fire? Well, you're going to put it over the fire on the spit, or you're going to take it outside and you're going to bury it in, in straw and set light to it. Are we going to do that now? I don't think so. Oh, you are joking. This is our authentic medieval reenactment. Are we really going to do it like this? So what do I do? You just get the torch to light. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Go on. That was a surprise, right? Yeah. OK, now you're going to take the hand there and you're going to get the bristles yeah. down that way and you're going to scrape it. Scrape it hard. Why do I scrape it? Because you want to get all that burnt stuff out of the way. Oh, it's like giving someone a haircut, isn't it? Yes. Oh, slightly more effective and quick, though. Be methodical. Be methodical. Would there have been much meat on one of these? There's a fair amount of meat, but we're going to actually stuff it with more meat. It's quite a... Come on, yes, and you've got to get this done. Quite a little whiff, isn't it? You've got it? to yeah. get this done. Come on. Is this the ear? That's the ear. You can leave the ears. Oh, leave those, right? Yeah, you can leave the ears. The one bit I do well, and you tell me I don't need to do that. Cool, there is a lot of this stuff, isn't there? Oh, yes. It's very thick. The assistant was way down the kitchen pecking order. You couldn't pop down the supermarket for another boar's head, so one false move and you'd be having a very unmerry Christmas. And if you mess this up, yeah. you realise you're out. What do you mean out? You're out, there's no job. This is the centrepiece, you've got to get it right. This is the testing This is, this is your test. Yeah. Oh, great. And if I did it well? If you did it well, you'll start to get your promotion. Look at this, look at, just look at this. Ba -ba! Oh, come on, don't play around. Get I'm not, I'm just revelling in the trial. If you've ever singed your hair, you'll know that it niffs a bit. The dense coat of a boar really, really stinks. Oh, did you get something in your throat? I'm so sorry. Don't look cook it, don't cook the meat. Oh, Pretty clean, isn't it? Yes, it's not bad. Right, what's next? Well, you're going to bone it. Oh, um, what do we no. do with that? Can we sew it up? No, no, that's it. You've, you've ruined it. You've ruined Christmas. I've ruined Christmas? You've ruined Christmas. Oh, what a stigma. Now, back to the spit. Uh, I'm demoted, isn't I? Yes. But demotion wasn't the worst news for the cook's assistant. This is what you're going to eat. Oh, you're kidding. What is it? It's the pluck. The pluck? Yes. The insides? Yes. Of what? A deer. These are numbles, all the insides of a deer that no one else will touch. The recipe is simple. Now, do you? Parboil them in oh, yeah, oh, a in, bucket of water. Chop into gobbets, that's gob sized pieces, leaving the windpipe to one side. Oh, it's coming on lovely, this. Right. Add onions, ginger, herbs, a load of bread to make it mushy, and thankfully red wine. Whoa, yes! <laughs> Do you know that is the nicest thing I've smelled all day? And that's the original numble or umble pie. The worst jobber's Christmas treat. Right, eating humble pie. Mm. Oh. Oh. You've got an enormous alcoholic hit with red wine. It's all right, isn't it? But it's all right if you like liver and lights and heart and stuff. 
beautiful. Luckily for me, we had a spare boar's head. The cooked head is finished off by making it look lifelike. You rub it with a dubious mixture of lard and soot. So let's find out what the nobility feasted on. Right, here we are. I've got very sooty fingers. I don't fancy that. That's nice, isn't it? It is nice. Oh, it's a bit fatty. There's a lot of fat running through it, but... Oh, yes. Very rich. Mm. Fatty. Mm. Not rich, fatty. Oh, it's not bad. If I was cast away on a desert island, I could live on this. Medieval Christmas was a weird mixture of Christianity and pagan customs. Along with the boar's head, no Christmas feast was complete without the giant Yule log. If you've ever enjoyed a slice of chocolate Yule log, you may be surprised that it was originally a fertility symbol from the old Viking feast of Eula. The Yule log had to burn throughout 12 days of feasting, so they needed the biggest tree in the forest. This meant there was a worst job attached. The Yule log fella had to set off in the harshest midwinter weather to take on his toughest challenge of the year. This one's ours, Andy. I think this one here. Right. If we drop it that way, yeah. then it'll be easier, easier to drag out. One axe, one tree. Me? Yeah. There's about seven of these guys. Yeah, but we, we've all done it before, so... There you go. This is hard work with 9th century technology. Hey Andy. Yeah? I've managed to get a lot of bark off. Well, it's a start, I suppose. <laughs> After half an hour, my initial enthusiasm had melted away in a large pool of sweat. And this was pine. With oak or ash, your yule log could be twice as thick as this, weighing several tons. Yes! Oh, look at that! Excellent! Oh, what a satisfying feeling. <laughs> Even once the tree's down, there's more hard slog, trimming scores of branches. Fortunately, this time, my fellow Vikings joined in. Then the entire bulk of the Yule log has to be dragged slowly home. At Yule time, it was the death of the old year, and the new year was going to be born. And that's the reason you needed fertility. So you went out into the forest, and you found the largest log you could see, the largest tree, and you cut it down. It's so the log itself is a fertility yeah, symbol? Yeah, yes, yeah, a fallow symbol, I think, yeah. yeah. And it needed to be green because it should contain the juice of nature. During Yule time, you needed to drink. You drank to Odin, you drank to Frey, and you drank to Njord, which also was a fertility garden. And you were dependent upon these gods to get the good harvest for the next year. Andy, what do you think the blokes were doing? These guys have been up since first light, they've worked all day, they've probably not eaten hardly anything. So now it's just, it's food and beer and warmth. It's just like Christmas nowadays, isn't it? Yeah, it's exactly the same. I mean, it's just, this is the place to be. It's as simple as that, and especially after the day they would have had. So our traditional Christmas is a real jumble of pagan and Christian traditions. In the 17th century, the Puritans grew more and more suspicious of this festival, which smacked of magic and superstition. 1644, And after the Civil War, Cromwell and the Puritan Parliament decided to ban Christmas. 
The Puritans hated Christmas. They called it the heathen's feasting day, the superstitious man's idle day, Satan's working day. Evergreens were banned and Christmas puddings. They shut down the churches. Even humble pie was forbidden, which is probably just about the only plus. And on December the 25th, all the shops had to stay open. Come on, open up. And the ultimate Mr Nasty responsible for enforcing the ban on Christmas was the Justice of the Peace. Robbing people of their Christmas celebrations was not only unpopular, it was highly dangerous. Because just as fast as the magistrates went round demanding that the shopkeepers open up, so mobs of workers and apprentices followed behind them, insisting that they close them again. In 1646, in Berris and Edmonds, there was an armed confrontation between a crowd of youths with clubs with nails in them and a few JPs and constables who ended up defending one solitary shop for the whole of Christmas Day. Now, that really is a worse job. Here's a Christmas riddle for you. What's the connection between Jane Austen, Christmas dinner and Northern Ireland? Well, by the 18th century, the Georgians had developed their own refined and tasteful Christmas celebrations. The place settings were very much like what we have today. They'd have had knives and spoons, and this is a new innovation, the fork. The whole thing would have been on a crisp linen tablecloth, and the port would have been poured into elegant glasses. But all this elegance was bought at a price. And the price was paid by workers here on the shores of Ireland. Well, it's here, yeah. it? The production of both the linen and the glassware that graced the Georgian Christmas table needed vast quantities of the chemical soda. It was obtained from seaweed which was harvested and burnt to make blocks of soda known as kelp. Whole families used to be employed as kelp collectors, easy, yeah. rushing out barefoot at low tide to harvest this slimy, stinking resource. You only had a few hours to get at the seaweed, and the bad news is that it took 20 tonnes to make one tonne of kelp. You're propelled along, really, by the weight of the stuff. I prefer the harvesting to the carrying. Yeah. Here you are, Thomas. Got you some more. Great, great. Is the worst bit over? No, no, you have another two days. Uh, give us a oh, you... Hey, give me a hand. Right. I'll be stuck here forever. So there's another whole part yeah. of the process. Well, the next stage is burning it. We'll have to reduce it to the kelp, the ashes of the seaweed. And that takes two days. So you have to be in attendance all day today, tomorrow, tonight, tomorrow and tomorrow night because it needs constantly raked, the fire needs spread evenly around. OK, so uh, what exactly happens in there then? Well, that slowly burns uh, down to a sort of porridge-like mass at the bottom. Yeah. Then you let it cool off and it's, uh, it's very, very heavy. It's heavier than lead. It becomes a solid mass and uh, then you break it up. You have to break it up with sledgehammers and it's then carried to a storehouse. They have to get it in out of the rain because it's very soluble as fast as possible. And it's brought to market. This must have been quite a big industry. Massive coastal industry. We have these amazing descriptions and, and some paintings of, say, this part of the coast and every few hundred yards there's a smoking kiln like this. It's very greasy, isn't it? These guys and women must have got filthy. Yeah, the smoke went into the pores and their faces were totally black. But after they finished the two days burning, they went off to their sweat house. Uh, it was it's like a like, sauna or something. It was a, an Irish version of the sauna. But the girls who were working here would go in and sit in, sit in a sweat house for three or four hours until they, they got all the, uh, the soot and oil out of their pores. They don't do this kind of process, presumably. No, no, it's a long dead uh, uh, industry. It really collapsed here in the 1820s. Uh, uh, they discovered they could get soda from, from salt uh, by, uh, by a new method. And within a year or so, 
the money all went. It's a massive recession, presumably. Massive recession. It was very, very hard around the, the Irish coastline and the Scottish coastline. Because they've forgotten how to fish and farm something. Because this is they've been doing all the money. But this terrible job that mixes sleep deprivation, stench, filth and smoke got another lease of life when they found that kelp was also rich in iodine. It got another extra boost by the end of the 19th century because uh, they used it in the photographic process, part of, the, part of developing. So all those romantic photos of the kelp burners couldn't have been taken if it hadn't have been for the iodine that the kelp burners That's were extracting. Right, yeah. I have to say, after you've been stuck in here for a bit, you can, you can hardly see anything. It is <coughs> so... It's like a really greasy oil that gets in your skin and gets in your nose. And it doesn't have stink of rotting seaweed. By the 19th century, the festive season was getting much closer to our modern Christmas. Victorians had Christmas trees, Christmas cards and panto. In fact, Panto dates back at least 200 years. Most of the jokes are that old too. And it comes with its own very obvious worst job. A lot of performers love doing pantomime. To be frank, I can't stand it. Eight, sometimes 12 shows a week, all that dreadful dialogue. Lots of screaming kids. But if you are going to be in a pantomime, be Buttons, be the Dame, be Cinderella. Don't be the back end of a cow. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The downside's obvious. It's hot, sticky, dark, silly and anonymous. And for the back end, it means you spend your working life bent double with your nose pressed into a colleague's bottom. In the Victorian age, actors like Johnny Fuller specialised in playing animals. They transform themselves into spookily man-shaped poodles, pussy cats, even monkeys. Come on, Annie, come, don't be shy. There's a good girl. Oh, I say it, she is lovely. Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> but at least at the back end of a cow, there's no danger. Unlike the worst job backstage that gave us our modern panto experience. <laughs> If you want to get all your laughs in a modern pantomime, your first priority is to be seen. The stage needs to be bright and attractive and well illuminated. And that hasn't always been the case. Up to the beginning of the 19th century, this is the kind of light that you'd have been lit by on a stage. It's dull, it's flat, it's gaslight. You can see my gut better than you can see my face here, can't you? If I wanted to be brightly lit, I needed to be in the limelight. Right, that's limelight. What exactly was it? Well, it was the burning of calcium oxide in a very intense flame. And when did the job of limelight begin? Well, famously, the first recorded instance in many ways was a production of pantomime by the famous actor manager William McCready in the Theatre Royal in Drury Lane in 1827. How was the process of lighting by lime discovered? Well, it was a chap called Goldsworthy Gurney who was an inventor, and he invented a blowtorch which became the Gurney torch, which used hydrogen and oxygen for a flame. And I suppose he was messing around with this thing, wondering what to do with it, and he found that when he played the flame on a lump of lime, it gave this intense white light. You're going to show us what that light's like? Yes, indeed. Can we get this costume on? So, yes. So did the whole process of lime lighting develop? It did indeed, yes. It started with uh, just flooding the stage with this new light source, which was 40 times brighter than the gas equivalent. And then they decided, or they found a way of controlling it by putting a lens in front of it, and it became a much more precise instrument, a bit like today's follow spots. Where did the limelighters stand? The limelighters operated from the wings up to the side of the theatre. Right, you ready? This is gaslight, and this is limelight. Just a week or two ago, me poor old Uncle Bill. Ooh. Neil, you've never seen limelight before, have no, you? I haven't. That was quite amazing. I don't think you're going to be disappointed now. Okay. Why was limelighting such a bad job? Well, because you were using hydrogen, which is really very flammable, and oxygen. And in fact, to get the hottest flame, you needed two volumes of hydrogen and one volume of oxygen. So where's the lime? Um, the lime is 
here, this, this little, little thing here. And the lineman's job was to keep the lime in the hottest part of the flame. Just by adjusting those levers? Just by adjusting the levers. And the lime man has to keep the ratio of the two gases in that two to one ratio all the time. Now we had the separate gases in the cylinders. They, of course, had them in gas bags. Uh, but can you imagine mixing the hydrogen and the oxygen? That was really asking for trouble. That was really an explosive bag. One of the worst jobs in Christmas history. But which job is the very worst? Puke collecting was disgusting, but it didn't have the risks of Victorian showbiz. And even kitchen boys got their humble pie. No, for me, the very worst Christmas job of all has to belong to a woman. After all, it is women who bear the brunt of Christmas. It's them who peel the sprouts and wrap the kids' presents and try to keep the warring relatives apart. But imagine trying to do that after a grim month in freezing conditions, making sure that the rest of the nation has got something to eat. Without the job of turkey farmer's wife, we wouldn't have the traditional Christmas dinner. We eat 10 million turkeys every year. Most production today is mechanised, but some free-range farmers still prepare the turkeys like they used to. The farmer's wife had to face the job of pulling the guts out of hundreds of turkeys. But first, they had to take off the feathers in choking dust that was literally plucking hell. David, unless my eyes deceive me, you're not a woman. Was preparing the turkeys a woman's job? Yeah, my, my grandmother used to do um, this, plucking the turkeys, all her life. Uh, they used to do four or five hundred at Christmas. So you sling it over your knee like a banjo? Yeah, you can do it however you like, but I normally start on the neck. Yeah. And the more you can pull out, the better. Right. But you've got to be very careful not to tear the breast of the bird. Yeah. And some areas of the bird you can go hammer and tongs, and other areas you just take it nice and steady. Cool, I tell you what. It's a load of feathery dust coming off this bird. Yeah, it is. You'll be finding feathers for weeks after. All the little downy ones that get right up your nose, and then you've also got the problem of your fingers get sore after a while. Yeah. Um, and if you're doing a lot, they actually start to split. Really hurts your yeah. thumb after joint a while, just there after a while. You really yeah. know it, and uh, you're using different muscles you wouldn't use the rest of the yeah. time of year. So. Hey, look, it's coming off, isn't it? That's it. That's it. But this is what you're trying to avoid. Oh, torn a bit of skin. The big rip there. Yeah. So what would happen if I presented a plucked bird like that? That would probably be rejected. Um, that's the most important part, that, as you see. That's when it's brought to the table. So you'd be losing money just from one tiny little rip? Yeah, yeah. Although you'd quickly learn, I think. How long would it take an experienced plucker to do one whole bird? Anything between 20 minutes and half an hour. And how many do you reckon they'd have had on the farm in the old days? I suppose something up to about 500. And you had to get them done by Christmas, obviously, yeah. the one day when you can't be late. So you're under pressure all the time, aren't you? Yeah, a lot of pressure. Well, can we assume that I've done this wing? Because, quite frankly, if I do it properly, it's going to take me about a fortnight. What happened next? Well, they used to hang them to get a bit of flavour to them. Yeah. Um, and then you take the tendons out of the legs, the sin pull the sinews out of the legs. And that was a woman's job? You'd have to be quite a strong, big, buxom woman to do that. Am I buxom enough? Well, should we see? Yeah. So what you do now is pull the sinews from the leg. One, two, three. <coughs> oh, nothing. <coughs> oh. <laughs> it's easy, isn't it? Yeah. <sighs> so this isn't the worst part, is it? No, that'd be the gutting. Yeah, I had a feeling of dread rising up in my throat. Yeah. Doing the neck end's bad enough. You have to unwrap the skin like a stocking, cut off the neck, and remove the crop, the strange white sack where the turkey stores its food. Then it's over to me for the really gruesome job of tugging out all the innards through the turkey's bottom. Down here and around the vent. Won't all the poo come out? Yeah, well, you've got to be careful. You, you don't, we, you know, we don't want poo everywhere. That's yeah. an important thing, so. So how do I avoid it? Just, Just go around the side. way around, yeah, at a slight angle there. Yeah. So now that's loose. Oh, that wasn't bad, was it? That's not too bad, yeah. Now, this, is this the bit I want to yeah, avoid? Yeah, you don't start pulling it yet because you don't want to break the tube. No. You put your hand in. Right. And try and release all of the guts, go around. 
Don't want to stain my dress. No. Oh, <laughs> I found something squidgy. Yep. That's it. So just work your hand in and work it over and around. Yep. And you want to go right in. Oh. Apart from going through a lot of very interesting squidgy things, it's not bashing my hand against the rib cage. Yeah, well, you, you've got the ribs there and you've got to fetch the lungs out from the ribs. Yeah. And it'll, it'll rip your knuckles after you've done a few. So you reckon that the women who did this would have had bruised hands? Yeah, bruised and swollen hands, yeah. Do you hear that? Yeah, that's it. That's not bad, is it? That's pretty good. Now, what do I do with this lot? We can't throw it away just yet because yeah. we need a few things from it to go with the giblets. Yeah. So we need the heart. That's the heart? Yeah. That's it. And then the lungs. Yeah. Turkeys were brought to Europe by the Spaniards in 1519. We'll cut, we'll and it's Henry the VIII line. who's said to have first had turkey instead of goose for Christmas dinner. I can't tell you. The smell that is coming off the... Oh, God, I've burst the little sack with yeah. all the brown juice. But in turkey it, yeah. didn't really catch on until Victorian times. I'm glad you're doing this bit. And you, and you slice. Mm. Up to your wrists in gunk, it doesn't make much difference if it's goose or turkey. And gutting Why are you is freezing. Want to keep the Turkeys are kept cold so they oh, stay fresh and the gut comes out in one blob. So your hands are bruised on the rib cage and blue with cold. And then there's the stuff you don't want to eat. Oh, there's stuff. I can see stuff. Yeah. Look at that stuff. So that's the inside of it, and you see there's Oh, yeah. Oh, loads of stones and stuff. Stones there. and stuff. Yeah. Disgusting, but strangely interesting. Cool. Oh, oh he's hadn't done that. <coughs> what a stupid thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> and now I can scoop this away. That's it. Yeah, we're done with all that. What do you have for your Christmas dinner? Beef. I'm not surprised. No, I have turkey. So that's one done, another. Four hundred ninety-nine to go. <laughs> One thousand nine hundred and seventy eight, one thousand nine hundred and seventy nine, one thousand nine hundred and eighty, one thousand nine hundred and eighty one, one thousand nine hundred and eighty two, one thousand nine hundred and eighty four, eighty three, one thousand eight hundred and eighty three.